So I think the, the initial idea came from being born on an island um, and also traveling to several islands. And while I was living there as well, um, there was always this omnipresent hum of the diesels, whether it was from the long tail boats or uh, from the diesel generators. And I, I just thought it was too much of a clash between the beautiful landscapes and the sound and the smell of diesel um, that I, I wanted to bring hydrogen to the islands to provide them energy security, energy independence. Uh, to keep the the environment as beautiful as it can be, and to make it feel as if um, as if humans had never really touched it, or at least as close as that can be from from the very beginning of of islands when they were undiscovered. And we like to keep this control of every single step because we get the full overview, and then we can know what we can optimize, what we can eliminate, um, and it it really enables us to to go faster in the future. But setting this foundation in the beginning um, and really understanding what is necessary, what is critical, has been the biggest challenge to know what kind of talent do we need to hire um, and what kind of expertise yeah, do we need to gain. We don't specialize, we don't focus only on mobility, we don't only focus on power to gas, we, uh, we focus on making a very cost-effective electrolyzer and know that everyone then can use it. Bonjour, bonjour and welcome to Mission First, the podcast to get inspired and to learn from successful entrepreneurs who are building a sustainable future for our planet and its people. I am Gilles Toussaint, your host and the founder of GT Impact, a growth and digital marketing agency working only with companies making a positive difference in this world. Growing a company that aims at having a sustainable impact is not easy. That's why I created Mission First, in each episode, I interview one entrepreneur who has a sustainable mission and who has recently gone through the difficult first years successfully. Together, we discuss their challenges and what they have learned on the way. We go into detail with a specific focus on company culture, leadership, financing, growth, and business strategy. That way, you learn hands-on tips on how to build a better future and a successful company too. Today, I welcome Vaitea Kowan, one of the co-founders of Enaptor. With her company, they have for mission to bring hydrogen and clean energy to the islands. For that, they developed an electrolyzer that produces green hydrogen. This high-tech product can, among others, replace diesel generators. It uses renewable energy to produce hydrogen that can then be used for various applications like mobility, planes or vehicles with hydrogen fuel, industrial use, use of the pure hydrogen, or to produce green electricity when used in combination with a fuel cell. Enaptor has closed a Series A funding of 8.7 million euro and is now thriving with 94 employees in four different locations in Europe and Asia. Their products are already being used in 33 different countries and their next stage is to mass produce these electrolyzers in Germany, with soon over 200 more employees to be hired. Vaitea is such a nice person with an exciting background and story that led to the creation of Enaptor in Thailand and its development in Russia, Italy and Germany. So I'm thrilled to welcome her today. Vaitea, thank you for being with us today. How are you? Thank you very much, Jeet, for having me. I'm great. Quite excited to, to share about our journey and uh, share about our mission. Uh, we have a pretty pretty straight focus on, on what we want to do. And I'm uh, really excited to share it with your audience as well. Can you start by telling me a bit directly, like going into the, the personal things, uh, which person has inspired you to become an entrepreneur? I think my whole family uh, on my mother's side, they are all entrepreneurs in their own style and fields or sectors. And I, I never actually thought about it. Uh, but as you ask me this, it's true. They are the ones who showed me you don't need to have anything to start something. And if you work hard at it and believe in it, involve the right people and keep trying every day, you will be successful. Um, so I would definitely say it's, uh, it's my family that showed me this example of, of giving it your best shot and uh, not having any fear. It's very often the case. It was the same case with Luba Milla and... Uh... I think it's it's a normal thing when you have parents who are entrepreneurs to just want to repeat the same thing, probably as as you you've seen probably the the good and the even the bad sides of it. 
Definitely, yeah. And I think it's it's interesting because it's not even like my parents directly that are necessarily entrepreneurs. I think it's really like my aunts and my uncles. Um, but my parents are the ones who traveled. So I would definitely mix the both like the traveling side and the entrepreneurship side, which kind of shape up uh, how, how my story and journey began. Yes, because you have a very like international background. I saw in your background that you studied in You are from New Caledonia, if I'm if I'm mm -hmm. correct, and, and you studied in, in in part in in the United States and then in, in Montreal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's quite a journey. Um, so I was born in New Caledonia, where um, my brother was born and where my parents met. And when I was nine months old, we moved to Maryland, and I I studied there, went to a French international school there, and then uh, did my university studied studies in Montreal, which is very fun, but also very cold. And um, this is how uh, <laughs> this is actually what prompted uh, prompted me to to explore Southeast Asia and uh, and go seek a little bit of sun. <laughs> yes, because I saw that like we'll talk about it in a minute, but that your your company roots are uh, like based in, mm -hmm. in 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 Chiang Mai in Thailand. Yeah, yeah, they are. That's how it all started. <laughs> So you are one of the co-founders of Enaptor. Do, do I pronounce it correctly, Enaptor or Enaptor? Yeah, Enaptor. Are you Enaptor. curious about the, the meaning? <laughs> It's actually, a, 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 I didn't think about it. So tell me, what does it mean? I think you might be the first one to know this publicly. <laughs> so Enaptor comes from two words, energy adapter. And why we chose this name is because this is the role of hydrogen and this is the role of our device is to take excess renewable energy and to transform it into hydrogen, which can be applied to all of our sectors. So it's not only to store power and then use it as uh, use hydrogen for electricity generation, but also to be used for mobility, for industrial uh, applications, as well as heat. So we are yeah, really so, <laughs> adapting. So <y> you are, <laughs> you, you answered a lot to my next question at the same time, which is great. So You are your mission is to bring hydrogen to the islands. This is what I've like read on your LinkedIn profile. So talking about the can you explain us in, in a few words what are the two like uh, products that you are developing? Because I saw two products on your on your page. And uh, talk a bit about like the, the applications itself. Sure. So the first product is a hardware, it is an electrolyzer which has two inputs, electricity and water, and the output is hydrogen. It's uh, um, complemented by our software, which is an energy management system, which enables us to remote monitor and control uh, the performance of our electrolyzer, but also to combine it with other energy devices, because we know that our electrolyzer is only one piece of the puzzle, but to decarbonize an industry or just simply to be energy independent, you also need solar panels, inverters, fuel cells, a battery. And this is what our uh, software is enabling us to do, to combine all of these energy devices and follow their performance. So together, um, the electrolyzer and the EMS are uh, the building blocks, we believe, for a, a clean energy future. And they are already running today um, in over 33 countries uh, and across all sectors. So, for example, they're used to um, produce green hydrogen to um, in one of the first uh, hydrogen projects for residential heating. So in the Netherlands, there is uh, an apartment complex uh, that has these innovative boilers that combust hydrogen uh, to heat the apartments. The area of... Um, applications that we've had in, in mobility is on-site hydrogen production to refuel drones as well as cars and most recently hydrogen planes. So that's been quite an exciting one uh, to be involved in and why hydrogen planes can pick up now is also because the cost of refueling planes is reduced now that the fuel is made on-site at the airport with one of our systems. So to to make sure I understood completely, your system is part of a hybrid system. So like the electrolyzer is doing, to talk about chemistry a little bit, the, the, the hydrolysis of the water. So basically using electricity to separate O2 and like the oxygen and the hydrogen from the water 
and uh, and so the electricity you have to have an input of electricity which in the ideal world comes from like renewables like wind or solar energy and your system is coming just after the solar energy generates electricity it combines it's uh, it transforms the water into oxygen and hydrogen and then you can use uh, hydrogen to uh, for the planes or to generate electricity on the other uh way around as well or not? So um, everything you've just said is perfect. And then once the hydrogen is generated, you can either store it in a storage tank or you can use it directly if it's uh, for an industrial uh, application, for example, where hydrogen is what you need, whether it's to use hydrogen as um, the pure element or uh, whether it is used in a fuel cell which this is the device that transforms hydrogen into electricity. So it's like the battery for the system in that case. Kind of. You, store, think... you, you, can, you can use it to store the, you store the hydrogen coming from the solar and then you can use it whenever you want after. Yeah, so the battery, I think if we were to compare it, it would be the electrolyzer, the storage tank and the fuel cell. Okay, yeah. Um, so understanding a bit more now about the products, you have the, the electrolyzer and the energy management system. Um, uh, and they are used for different applications. So yeah. as you said, it very well, it's, it's, that's, I guess, how you bring uh, hydrogen to the islands for these like private energy storage. Um, why did you choose to develop that application and not, for example, start to work on a, I don't know, a, a plane with hydrogen, for example? So I think the, the initial idea came from being born on an island um, and also traveling to several islands in the South Pacific, but also in Thailand. And it's quite common that diesel generators are running and are providing energy security. And, you know, it's not only CO2 pollution, but it's also noise pollution. And if you think about it, where is the diesel coming from? It's not... You know, the natural environment of the island is not also sitting on diesel. So it's just, it doesn't make much sense to, to use diesel in such idyllic places. Um, so when I was traveling to, to Thailand and while I was living there as well, um, there was always this omnipresent hum of the diesels, whether it was from the long tail boats or uh, from the diesel generators. And I, I just thought it was too much of a clash between the beautiful landscapes and the sound and the smell of diesel. Um, that I, I wanted to bring hydrogen to the islands to provide them energy security, energy independence, uh, to keep the, the environment as beautiful as it can be and to make it feel as if, um, as if humans had never really touched it, or at least as close as that can be from, from the very beginning of, of islands when they were undiscovered. But no, I think it's, it's also just to bring them back to their natural state. Um, water and sun is abundant. They are available on the island, so it makes sense to use the available resources on an island um, to provide them their energy security and energy independence. Yes, it's also, like, I never thought about it, but it's also so annoying when you are in these beautiful islands or remote places, and then it's you start a, a generator, uh, like, super loud generator mm -hmm. usually and i didn't think about the advantage and the pros of using an electrolyzer because in that case it's it's silent exactly <laughs> oh yeah so uh talking a bit about inaptor before going back to your story and how it started uh can you give me a bit some in, like some info about the, the the team itself how many employees do you have right now what's the company size Sure. So I think now uh, we had a colleague just start uh, two days ago and we are about 94. Um, the breakdown is about 40 people, um, 40, co 40 colleagues in, um, in Italy. And in Italy, we have our research and development facility. So our electrochemists are sitting in Pisa as well as with our engineers that are developing the products, but also the assembly team and the final acceptance team. So most of our colleagues are uh, sitting in Italy. They must be actually be now 40 to 50. So it's quite a, quite a big chunk of us there. Then we have our location in uh, Bangkok and Chiang Mai. It's quite a hybrid office 
where we have uh, our CFO there, our head of strategy, um, uh, a business analyst, um, our creative director is there as well. Um, the next location is uh, St. Petersburg in Russia, where we have our software developing team. Um, they're, uh, they're always full of surprises, it's a very interesting culture to, to work with and always uh, full of solutions. Um, and they're about uh, 17, I think. And then in Berlin, we have our Hauptstadt Büro, um, where uh, we're sitting our marketing team, uh, our governmental affairs uh, colleague, as well as a project engineer, our uh, hiring manager. Um, and we're about uh, seven or eight now today, our academic advisor as well. So yeah, that's pretty much the, the whole family. And I, I think an explanation as well of why why four locations um, is actually the since the beginning we said okay we will follow we will be have locations where the talent is so we had a very uh, talented CTO and he was based in Saint Petersburg so we opened an office there uh, our roots are in Thailand so Bangkok is the capital is also the reason why we have a, an office in Bangkok uh, Berlin. Uh, made sense as Germany is a very active country in hydrogen and I was quite curious to, to move to Europe after Chiang Mai so Berlin was the point of destination and Pisa is actually where the technology was developed and invented and um, there was no reason to move the, the, the labs anywhere else than where it first originated. Okay, so the technology was developed in, in, in Italy, software in Russia, hybrid in uh, Chiang Mai, Bangkok, and then all the rest in uh, in, in Berlin. Yeah. <laughs> and in terms of, so it's it's a pretty big family, as when you say it's a family, you already grew pretty pretty much. Uh, you already grew a lot, so. In terms of financing, where are you now? Are you? I, I saw you had like a. a, a you had a Series A round, investment round. So are you planning another round soon? Are you already profitable? Have you like broke even yet? <laughs> um, so it's a very uh, <laughs> high, uh, it's an intensive uh, business that we're in. Uh, we are, we actually just bought a scanning electrons microscope, which is one of the coolest toys you could ever have as a chemist, <laughs> I think. Yes. <laughs> uh, so um, we're, we, we keep investing in R&D, so I think we keep uh, <laughs> spending more than we're making, but always for the, the right reason uh, in order for us to, to have a more efficient product uh, and a more powerful one as well. So um, I think in terms of financing, we are, we are closing our round B at the moment. And uh, we have great plans ahead for for what to do um, with all this, with all the, the investments. Um, happy to share more if you're curious about our plans. <laughs> yes, and it was a pretty big uh, Series A, where it's like four point seven million euros uh, dollars or so. It shows us how far you are with a company, which is the most important. Um, let's start now to start to go back to the start, actually. So. Can you explain us a bit how did you meet you and your co-founder? Like, can you describe us the, the co-founder like team, and when was it? How did you meet? How did all of this start? Sure. So it was quite uh, spontaneous. Definitely, um, we were all strangers before this whole adventure started. So as I said in the beginning, I was studying in Canada and decided to to go to Thailand uh, with a friend and explore what uh, GEMS Southeast Asia had. And we were working both remotely uh, and online. And I I actually missed this connection of, of people. I'd never worked online and, and I thought it was interesting. It gave us a lot of freedom, but it also made me very curious about what was going on in Chiang Mai. It was such a beautiful place with quite a lot of international individuals. Um, surely something interesting was, was brewing in the background. And this is how I actually stumbled upon uh, the Fisue House project, which blew my mind because I didn't even know that such technology existed uh, in the world. 
And so the idea of the Fils de la House is to be completely self-sufficient from an energy standpoint, but also from a water and agricultural standpoint. And it's usually when, when we think of um, living off grid, we might think about you know, a cabin uh, or, or a tent, uh, but we think of very simple um, and, and basic um, housing or basic comfort. And actually here I saw this home that had this whole architecture design um, to it. So it was not only high tech, but it also uh, the aesthetic factor was there as well. So I was very curious when I saw that the, um, the, the energy system was running on hydrogen because I knew it was an abundant element, but I didn't realize it could also be used to power a uh, lifestyle. So I thought, okay, this the person behind this idea must also be very interesting. Um, and so I, I went off to, <laughs> to, to meet Sebastian. Uh, I found that Sebastian also had a creative agency in Chiang Mai. And so I realized it was 10 minutes from where I lived, um, got some fresh baked cookies and brought my CV along with me and rung the doorbell of the creative agency to see um, what they were doing, if they had any openings. I had just graduated with my business degree, full of confidence and big dreams. And uh, surely I could bring some value in their team. And uh, that's pretty much how I met Sebastian and um, got to meet his team of engineers and his teams of the designers that were, uh, and the, the entire team behind the Fils Warehouse. Because when we met, the house was not yet completed. The, um, first technology, technological phase had finished, uh, which was the energy home and the two guest houses. But his vision did not stop there. It went on to having a main home, a kitchen, uh, and, and many other supporting buildings. So it's truly a multi-house residential complex. And um, I was lucky enough to, to, to have the chance to, to help him um, promote this idea of green hydrogen. And the idea was to make the Fiswea House a, a lighthouse project in Southeast Asia and to make it into a communication and a collaboration platform for others to come visit the home, see the system, see how it works, trust it, and then get inspired to choose hydrogen as a long-term energy storage solution. And was that home at the time, you said he, has, he, he had his team of engineers, was he using, you know, available equipments there, but just, you know, arranged them in a certain way? Or had he already developed some, some of the technology you are using right now? Sure. So his son was leading the, the whole team of uh, the electricians, engineers, and he designed the microgrid. And at the heart of the microgrid is our electrolyzer. And the electrolyzer that he is using was not a commercial good, let's say. It was quite a niche product that Sebastian discovered in a telecommunications and mobile operators uh, conference and show. And he saw these mobile stations that were uh, completely remote and had no access to the, to the, to the grid. Um, they were being powered by these electrolyzers that would collect the rain and then uh, Create, uh, use solar energy to create hydrogen to store it, and then um, the hydrogen would ensure the reliable service of these mobile operators. So when he saw this at a small scale, he thought, well, surely if these are replacing diesel generators for remote base stations, I could use this as well in my home, because his whole foundation is about leaving um, the world in a better place than in which he found it in. And so he wanted to have no carbon, no diesel, and that's why he chose hydrogen as an energy storage solution. So he discovered this small Italian company that was producing these, these electrolyzers. And those are the ones that he uh, chose for his home and that Jan, uh, the third co-founder, uh, uh, integrated into the microgrid that he designed in order to meet the, the whole family's energy needs. Oh, super interesting. So business strategy in here, uh, I guess. <laughs> so how... What are the next steps after discovering that that home and how it works to to start commercializing and arriving to this idea of Inapture? How do you proceed? 
because you didn't have you had a technology you were using that were was not yours mm -hmm. but now you are making a like a a business out of it so how what are the next steps so once you acquired once you integrate it you start to use it you get very familiar with it and you understand how it works and um how reliable it is actually uh and seeing how well it performed and how it kept the lights on uh and um that it was uh, uh yeah it was as good as if you had your house connected to the grid um we we were confident of this technology and the the chemists that invented this technology are, are geniuses right they 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 made something that others haven't been able to do which is a cost effective electrolyzer um in a very compact shape uh, and form They're chemists, they're, they're not businessmen. So they were um, doing many different things, but not focusing on, 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 on the electrolyzer, which is really their, their hot product, let's say. And so um, we saw this opportunity, we trusted the electrolyzer. And um, because they were not businessmen, the, the company was going, was, was going bankrupt. And Sebastian, having a lot of faith in this technology, um, acquired the debt and... Um, This is how Anaptor started, is that we acquired the, the, the technology, the patents and the team, and um, we, we gave it uh, a vision. We gave it uh, the, the roadmap in, or, in order to commercialize this electrolyzer so that the cost of green hydrogen would be cost competitive with fossil fuels. So, oh, fantastic story. So that, that's <laughs> very interesting. So you, you, you didn't start the product from, from scratch. You saw this fantastic opportunity after believing into the product and using it mm -hmm. and so you 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 decide to i guess after you know a few a few chats i guess uh <laughs> to 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 help the team there to buy the debts and to start a new business which is in that case in Napster. correct uh, and what are the, the the big if you have to summarize from there until now uh we were at what time was were we at, at, at that time So 2016. at that time, when we had the, the meeting, <laughs> when we decided, okay, let's do this, this was in Bangkok in August 2017. And, uh, sure. and, and Napture was officially uh, uh, a company uh, in November 2017. Okay, and how do you finance that part? So you are three co-founders. How do you decide, okay, we're going to do that, the three of us, and how do you finance it? So this was all personally financed by Sebastian. So Sebastian um, had had quite some um, success in his uh, previous um, companies that he also had co-founded. He was in the mobile uh, space. He was um, uh, in the software space, actually creating um, video streaming and encoding softwares as a value-added service for mobile operators and content owners. And... Um, He, he realized that he also wanted to, to not only um, inspire Chiang Mai uh, communities, but also inspire the world uh, to shift away from fossil fuels. And he, it was purely, a, um, it was not just like philanthropical base in the very beginning, but it was okay. He decided to, to pivot, let's say, and, and completely commit to hydrogen. And he financed uh, the very beginning of an after. Okay. And so from there... How do you decide to go the three of you and not two or four of you or five of you? Well, I think we all believed in each other in the sense that we thought that we were we each had our strengths to bring this technology off the ground. Um, Sebastian had the entrepreneurial and uh, business experience. He also knew how to speak to investors and um, he, he already had an established network. His son um, had already had his, his master's and his, his MBA, um, and he had designed a, a microgrid um, that works. So he had the experience from an engineering standpoint um, and operational standpoint uh, in terms of leading a team uh, based in Pisa. And I was sort of adopted, I guess, <laughs> into the team um, from a, a marketing and a communication standpoint, since I had helped uh, promote the idea of the Pisoa House. And uh, I mean, we are still getting requests to visit it uh, on a monthly basis and also um, 
quite a few media requests. So clearly the, the house does stand as a lighthouse project for hydrogen in Southeast Asia. So um, I was taken on board and I was absolutely up for the adventure because the, the interest of sharing um, a, a solution for clean energy is really something that I, I believe in because in the beginning, I didn't really think about where do things come from. You think about where your food comes from. You may think about where your, your, your clothes come from. But where your electricity comes from, you usually just turn on a switch and you don't think about how far it traveled to get to you. And I felt like with Anaptor, it was something that I could also play a role in, 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 in bringing hydrogen to the world, but also sharing this knowledge and sharing this reflection to others of, well, hey, did you know that you could produce your own energy on site independently from anyone else? Um, so how do you divide the, the roles in, in that case uh, between the three of you growing up? And did, did that change while during the last three years? Well, I think we, we like to have fun. <laughs> so we've, um, we've stayed in the areas that we enjoy. Of course, there will always be some difficult tasks, but... Um, Jan really enjoys leading an engineering team, building the team and, and understanding how can we uh, mass produce our electrolyzers. So that was his focus. And he's been in this since the very beginning. Um, Sebastian enjoys uh, a lot of things. He's, he's quite an interesting character, uh, but he also enjoys um, uh, not too many of the operational tasks, let's say. Uh, so now he is our chairman and has maybe more of like a strategic uh, overview of what we are doing. Um, and I've, I've really enjoyed um, staying in the marketing and the communication. So I think what has changed is the growth and the size of the team. Um, and as more people join, our responsibilities do get distributed. In the very beginning, we were doing everything. Everyone was hiring. Everyone uh, was making calls to, to, in terms of business development or in terms of media. So the, the task was completely mixed. And as we grew, maybe up to 30, then we started really more distributing the tasks uh, and changing a bit of our focus. Um, but the, the initial... Um, uh, roles that we have are still the same now. It's just more uh, working with uh, with more colleagues, like working with a colleague in software, working with a colleague in electrochemistry. We have our our, our sort of head of chemistry, our head of software, and um, and now it's a much more uh, diverse conversation. Let's say in terms of the knowledge and the expertise and the solutions that we come up with together. How big was the the uh, team in in Italy when you when you started? We were, they were 11. 11, and now it's about 40, you said, huh? Um, yeah, definitely not less than 40. Okay, and what were the, the most challenging parts, you think, I mean, <laughs> company-wise, and then we can talk about your specific case, but company-wise, in, in the last two to three years, what were some kind of like pivotal moments and, and decisions? I think one of the hardest things as a company has been how can we mass produce our electrolyzers? We are inventing a new technology that only 40 people, let's say 90 people as a team, know how it's made and what it requires in terms of processes um, and skills and knowledge. So the biggest challenge was how can we make more? How can we make it faster? Um, because we do, we, we do everything from the very beginning until the end and the assembly and the testing. So no one else is involved. And we like to keep this control of every single step because we get the full overview and then we can know what we can optimize, what we can eliminate. Um, and it, it really enables us to, to go faster in the future. But setting this foundation in the beginning um, and really understanding what is necessary, what is critical, has been the biggest challenge to know what kind of talent do we need to hire um, and what kind of expertise yeah, do we need to gain uh, because it's, it's um, we're, I mean, if you think of like how many, how many people we are in the team and, and how much uh, CO2 there is to, or how, many, how much fossil fuel there is to, to replace, um, it's a really big responsibility that we've set ourselves to, to go after. 
So the challenge is for us to, to uh, scale our technology and to learn how to mass produce and automate the production of uh, a device that we invented. Yes, because you have a, I saw a very interesting article from you explaining how we are at a, at a tipping point right now where, where the, these microgrid with, elect uh, with, hi with hydrogen are starting to, to become more affordable than, than the other ones. So the, your unique selling point is to, to basically have no like noble metal in, in your technology and so to be uh, cheaper and would you say more sustainable as well? Yeah, no, no, definitely. Uh, I think you're, you're touching on to an important point in terms of the sustainability, which, which I'll get back to. Um, our USP is definitely the price. Um, it's the cost effectiveness, the long lifetime and the high efficiency. That cost uh, advantage that you have, is it due mainly to the technology itself or is it also due to the how you are manufacturing it? Excellent question. Both. <laughs> it's um, not only the, the components that we are using, there's no gold, there's no platinum, there's no harmful materials. So everything we're using is fairly cheap, but also the scale at which we are producing them. Um, our concept is to make uh, standardized, compact electrolyzers that we can mass produce Because as soon as you go into economies of scale, then the individual cost of each module will significantly drop. And this is how we get to cost-effective green hydrogen. Okay, super interesting. Uh, and I'm happy to see that you know a lot about uh, technical knowledge. You told me that you sometimes were not the technical expert, but I can hear that at <laughs> least, most importantly, you can, you can convey it with very simple and understandable words. So thank you for that. Now that we know a lot about the product itself and the advantages, um, talking about the big decisions you had to take, what's your business model? Like, how do you make money? I mean, like, you could have gone for, uh, do you rent your electrolyzers or do you sell them? So how do you make money? Yeah, so I think it's, it's quite simple. It's uh, B2B. So we manufacture the electrolyzer and our customers are system integrators, engineering, procurement, construction companies, independent power providers. Um, they're businesses that understand how hydrogen works and what to do with an electrolyzer. So it's, um, it's not so focused in terms of which sector um, we should uh, sell our electrolyzers to because We believe that if we can make hydrogen so cheaply, then the rest will follow. We are at the very upstream of the value chain. So this is why our focus is on scaling the, the production to bring down the costs. The rest will follow and um, uh, we don't need to specialize. At least we are not trying or focusing on specializing on one specific sector. Others are looking for the applications of green hydrogen, but we believe that when the cost drops, then um, many new applications will open along the value chains of new and other businesses. And you can be part of it automatically. Mm -hmm, exactly. In B2B. Okay, very smart. Let's move a little bit to the do's and the, the don'ts that you, you sent me very kindly. So thank you very much for preparing this. Mm -hmm. And we decided to talk about um, the things you would recommend in terms of how to create an alternative fuel. So let's start with the do's. Um, the first one you sent me is, so in order to create an alternative fuel, understand your competition. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. And do you have example of, you know, how understanding the competition has impacted you and how, what you have adapted to that? We've understood that our competitors are focusing on making um, megawatt scale electrolyzers. And we are on the total opposite spectrum of that. Our focus is on making compact, standardized electrolyzers. So we are like the PC of the IT industry. Before it was the um, mainframe supercomputers, you couldn't even imagine about transporting them or moving them to somewhere else. And then the portable computer came and no one would have imagined that this would revolutionize the IT industry. And this is exactly what we're doing now, is that we see these enormous electrolyzers and 
you know, they've been around since the 1920s, so we respect them. But we also believe that our electrolyzers can completely disrupt it because we are making um, a standardized electrolyzer. Our goal is to make electrolyzers a product and ultimately a commodity. And you can compile, you can um, not compile them. Stack them, yes. Sure. You can stack them. We right? can stack them and there's no technical limit to stacking our systems. Okay, great. Thank you for that. The The second one was, uh, the second do was have the right team. So I think we, we, we touched that part uh, pretty much. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think having the right team is, is key to, to success. Um, and in the beginning, we were looking for enthusiasm only, and we found a lot of enthusiasm, but sometimes not enough skills. So um, I think enthusiasm uh, is really in is important, um, but it, it, it should not be the decision maker. Um, obviously, we're looking for the necessary skills, but sometimes you really need to dig a little deeper and understand what is the commitment behind a uh, um, uh, a new a candidate basically and having the right team really um, shines when you are in difficult times um, or yeah when you have a challenge ahead and you have to bring everyone together or the key people together to, to find the solutions so I think it's just really important in terms of the hiring process to hire slow to make sure that you have the right person so hire slow make the right decision and to fire fast um, if you realize the fit is wrong Yes, it's, it's, that's the hardest part sometimes when you have to terminate someone's contract. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you have any, um, when you say you, it's very important to, to judge the skills, what's your recruiting process looking like? Is it, first of all, the question is like, do you have some kind of standard process across the different like locations? And the second one is how do you evaluate hard skills? So we have two hiring managers at the moment, uh, and so depending on the language and the position, they will speak to one or the other. Um, this is pretty much like the first stage of interviews, and then it follows either speaking to Thomas, our head of strategy, or uh, Jan, if it's more of an engineering um, position. Uh, the third um, phase would then be uh, to speak to Antonio if we are uh, interviewing a chemist. Uh, and then sometimes Sebastian also steps in. So it really depends if we're talking about uh, chemistry, software, um, uh, engineering, marketing, communication, uh, business development. Um, software is quite an independent uh, hiring process um, and they've done really well. They're actually, we're so proud in, in, in Russia, we're in like the top 20, I think, or in the top 10 uh, software companies uh, in Russia, which is a pretty big deal. <laughs> Just to make sure I got it right, in Russia, have you outsourced the part of the like software development? Meaning, do, do, did you work? Do you work with a with an agency or with a company who was already there? It's taking care of everything and hiring its own persons for that, or did you build a company there? We built a team there. Yes. Okay. So it's all in house. Um, this is our team, Nikolai and Nikita, and the entire team uh, developing the energy management system. Um, then the third do's you said was walk the talk uh, and circular economy. So I'm very curious about that one. Yeah, it's um, it's something that I, I think now is becoming a bit more of a topic of what happens at the end of a lifetime of appliances, systems, you know, how do we recycle all these things that we're making? It's great to innovate and produce more, but what happens with the waste? And um, we are planning at the moment our mass production factory that will be located in Germany. And one of the principles is for it to be a net zero building. And we are planning for a building to be the recycling building where at the end of the lifetime of our electrolyzers, our customers and partners can give us back the electrolyzer and we will recycle it. We know exactly what's inside and we know there's nothing harmful to the environment, but we can absolutely still reuse uh, certain parts. So this is what we mean by the circular economy part is that we will take back and recycle the electrolyzer at the end of its lifetime. 
Okay, so that's what you mean by walk the talk. You really want to apply your basically your mission to yourself. Exactly. Yeah. So it's really, it's not only creating a new resource, but it's also uh, making sure that we take the responsibility to keep our uh, our environment clean. Uh, not only by powering it in a clean way, but to literally keep it clean. And how many people do you plan to hire for that, uh, like manufacturer? Um, that plant. I think. Over 200 people. Okay, and when is that plan to happen? So we will be producing, mass producing our electrolyzers there by 2022. Okay, and when you say there, it's not going to be in Berlin then? No, no, it's not going to be in Berlin. Um, we've shortlisted our locations and uh, soon, soon we'll break the ground. Okay, so we cannot talk about it now, then next time. <laughs> next time. Um, the second part of these do's and don'ts about the don't do these things. You told me don't follow general marketing practices, go to market <laughs> strategy. This was really difficult for someone who like exits, who not who exits, sorry. This was very difficult for someone who just finishes university with a mind packed of all these school books practices, um, to then, uh, be involved in a startup that decides we are not going to follow the typical go-to market strategies. And when you um, participate in challenges as well, there's always the question about what is your go-to market strategy. And this is something that we have not followed because we believe that um, not only new apply applications will come from very cost-effective hydrogen, but also why limit ourselves to a specific application when we know that the whole... Um, the four sectors uh, will benefit from uh, cheap alternative fuel. So this is why we don't, uh, we don't specialize, we don't focus only on mobility, we don't only focus on power to gas, we, uh, we focus on making a very cost-effective electrolyzer and know that everyone then can use it. So we let our uh, partners and system integrators um, uh, take the system and integrate it in the end solution and that whatever end solution it is, whether it's in the mobility sector, the power, the heat, um, or the industrial uh, sector, this is their decision. Okay, and it's a proof that that, that approach is actually working when I see the, the amount of partners that you, you have on your website, and we can tackle that topic in, in a few seconds, or in a few minutes. Um, last don't is stop repeating the purpose. What do you mean by that? So I think it's really important for the team to to remember why we are working so hard and so tirelessly uh, every day. Why do we wake up every day? And it's really to decarbonize our worlds, to give, is to stop borrowing from future generations and to 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 give the world a, an alternative and a clean one. So repeating our our, our purposes is reiterating why we do this and uh, why we we. Um, yeah, I think that's that's all it is. <laughs> you know, it's really uh, repeating to our team in, in every shape, whether it's um, vocally or on walls or um, in, in calls with other colleagues uh, or going to the restaurant, celebrating what we are doing, but always reminding each other that, hey, it's, it's tough or we're working a lot, but um, it is for a good cause. And we know the impact that we are doing at an individual scale, but also on a uh, global scale. Mission first. Exactly. Perfect. Love that. <laughs> um, when you're talking, we were just talking about partnerships, so we can jump to that uh, topic now. It's perfect timing. So I guess partnership in, in your case is very, like, it's crucial. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw on your website that you have, like, now more, uh, close to 20 different partners. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, you studied a partnership program, I think, uh, so that very recently on your LinkedIn post. So what are the different partners you you, you have? Uh, let's start with that one first. Sure. So our partners today are mainly system integrators and engineering procurement construction companies. And so their role is to um, buy a system and uh, integrate it in the end solution. So we do not do any of the service providing. Uh, they offer the turnkey solution and we provide them with the technology, which is the electrolyzer. And today it's, um, it's great to see so many partners on board. Um, 
across the world. So we have some in Indonesia, we have some in Malaysia, we have some in Germany, some in France, um, some in the US as well. And um, we can really see that um, our reach is also uh, increasing as more uh, partners come on board and uh, as they also take the responsibility to be a, a service provider for our electrolyzers. Mm -hmm. And do you have any lessons on, on these, like how you have established and set up all these partnerships of what, yeah. you know, what have you tried or where are the things that didn't work and that you adapted? Sure. So I think a really important point was to educate our partners. And what we do is that we hold system integrator trainings where we invite Uh, potential partners and existing partners as well um, to our factory in Pisa and to come learn about the electrolyzer. How does it work? How does it perform? How much, what can you do basically with it? What shouldn't you do? They learn about the security standards and the safety regulations. Um, they learn about our energy management system as well. So they really get a sort of boot camp on how uh, our electrolyzers work. And once they understand how the electrolyzers work, then uh, they feel more comfortable about the technology. And we can also trust that they know how to handle our electrolyzers and how to handle hydrogen. So I would say enabling your partners to become independent is, um, is the starting point. Okay. And so when you do these boot camps, you said sometimes with potential partners, so they are not partner yet, and you invite them to the boot camp to discover the your technology basically uh, how do you convince them to to come there do you do you wait for what are the first steps before you you get them uh, interested to come there so they usually come to us via our online form or we meet them at an exhibition and they already have experience integrating renewable energy and usually it's in the form of solar plus battery and they may be looking into uh, integrating hydrogen or they may have had a request uh, from a customer or another business that is interested in working in hydrogen and they are interested in developing their skills and knowledge in hydrogen or in specifically our technology. So usually they have, until now actually, um, all our partners have come to us and um, have requested to learn more. And as we un we filter them, I think this is being selective is, an, is, is very important um, not to just say yes to anyone and to understand what are their intentions, what is their track record, um, what is the vision for this company and is there a fit between what they're doing and what we're doing? Because the renewable energy is large um, and, and not everyone has the same agenda. So making sure that um, there is a fit is, is really important. So they would come to us. And um, when we understand that their interest in hydrogen is not just a one-time project, but that they actually want to develop uh, into this field and into the industry, then we see, okay, we both have a long-term vision on hydrogen and maybe we should consider being partners. The only way for us to become partners, it's like a relationship, you have to trust each other. And so we invite them to see us, to visit us in Pisa, and we get to know them as well. They can ask their questions, and we create this space and this time to get to know each other, to educate them on the electrolyzers, um, and for them to, to, to walk out confident that they understand uh, what they're getting themselves involved in, and, and same as for us. And these boot camps are taking place with several partners at the same time? Mm -hmm. or... Yeah. Okay, yes. and how long are they? Uh, they're about three days, so it depends on how many people join because we want to make sure that we give um, partners and potential partners the time to really understand. And so we keep the groups quite small to uh, yeah, under 10 people to make sure that we get the quality time uh, that is needed. So you said that these partners, you know, usually found you or find you first. Um, so in terms of awareness, what are the different like channels that you are using? I saw on my side that you're using, from what I saw, LinkedIn, some webinars, some events, uh, your website, of course. Um, so in terms of SEO, do you do anything? What is your strategy with events, LinkedIn, webinars? What, what, what are basically, if you have to summarize a bit, Uh, what are the different ch channels you use? What are the ones that have so far worked best? Mm -hmm. So as I, as I was mentioning in terms of uh, understanding your competition, um, a traditional industry works in the way that you have exhibitions. 
And so, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you pretty much uh, enter this prefabricated world for one week, and uh, and then it all comes down. Uh, all jokes aside, so you have exhibitions, and until um, this March, twenty twenty, uh, we used to attend the main conferences in hydrogen and in energy, which is the Hanover Messe in um, in Germany, as well as the a fuel cell expo which is held at the Smart World Energy Week in Tokyo, Japan. So these were our two main events that we attended as well as Intersolar in Munich and a few other ones uh, in France as well. So exhibitions was how we um, set our sort of marketing milestones. The classical say. marketing one for B2B yeah, companies. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So now It's a bit different, right? <laughs> we are we're using a whole new approach uh, where uh, we are actually making ourselves available virtually for people to come and meet us. So for potential partners, customers, um, for our ecosystem to to reach out to us. And so what we held was a ask me anything uh, session with our business development team. So we put them on a hot seat, and for 90 minutes, um, guests could. Uh, come in, come out, ask their questions, or stay the whole time. Um, and this is how we made ourselves available and, and put ourselves out there. Um, and the promotion was through social media and uh, email marketing. Um, so was it? were you using paid advertising in social media in that case? No, actually, we don't do any advertising. We... We, there's no The only um, investments we make in marketing has been for the exhibitions. Okay. And so these people online that were to join your, your webinars were coming only from the posts on social media. What I saw you were using LinkedIn, posting like four, right, by average four times a week. And I saw your company page has around 5,000 followers, which is mm -hmm. pretty good for a, for a B2B company. So what's your strategy on, on LinkedIn? And do you have any other social media you use? Yeah, I think LinkedIn is... Is, is our main focus at the moment since we are B2B. So if you think in terms of lead generation, then uh, this is where our prospects would be. Um, so I, I think the strategy here is to focus on LinkedIn and then also um, repurpose the content on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, recently Instagram. So um, what we do is that we create really solid content like ditching the diesel for hydrogen microgrids. That was a really uh, big piece for us, as well as sharing our ideas about the pricing of hydrogen and how it's not just about the capex, but the opex, the lifetime and the efficiency. So um, we, we, we focus on, on, on providing really good content to educate um, and to share our opinion on, uh, on the, the topics that we believe are, are really important in terms of green hydrogen today. And, uh, and we also try to... To, the effort is to make it, uh, to connect with the general audience as well through, um, through Facebook and through Twitter. And um, I think each platform has their own kind of surprises. Like you have some things on Instagram that don't exist on, on Twitter or on LinkedIn. And also the quality of conversations that you have on LinkedIn are totally different than the ones that you'll have on Twitter. So we have our different audiences on each platform and uh, we try to surprise them either visually or intellectually. How's the, the the feedback been on, on on Facebook? Because it's true that, for example, lots of B 2 B platform are like, why would I be on Facebook? Why would I be on Instagram? But I have a feeling from from my experience from talking with people as well that you know when you're active on LinkedIn, yes, it's great for B 2 B. But when you manage to and when you take so much time to create content, and I saw some of your content on your you know on uh, your inaptor infographic, for example, was, which is like a crash course presentation about <laughs> hydrogen applications, which is great for you know everyone. Uh, and when you share this kind of content on Instagram or Facebook, some people who are actually not might be your your potential customers might at least be attracted if they're inter uh, interested into sustainable things and just tag their friends and share it along. So, do you have some kind of success stories or? Since you started doing that, do you see some difference in terms of word of mouth and how people are like uh, coming to you? Yeah, uh, so maybe to first start off um, in terms of how Facebook has been an interesting platform for us to be on. Um, we realized that on Facebook, 
the our audience is very receptive to the energy management system because it's software based um there is maybe a easier entry um for for people that are into software basically and so to see the um, the visuals and to understand the the opportunity here to track your energy system uh to monitor it to remote control it um we saw that the energy management system and the 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 uh, sort of training and offer that we had uh, with the MPP inverter um, and our software generated a lot of interest uh, and our, our inbox kept on pinging on like, okay, I want this. How can I do it? Um, can I, when can I start? <laughs> uh, just to understand that part, is your EMS also applicable or like, can I use it for my energy system without using your uh, electrolyzer? Sure. If you wanted to to monitor your solar performance, you can also uh, just connect your solar panel and essentially the inverter um, to to the energy management system. Because we understand that the electrolyzer is only one piece and that it will need to connect with many other devices. So it doesn't need our electrolyzer, but... Um, and is it free for the people who want to download it? Uh, you can download the application, but you should have a system... Uh, from us or or one of the uh, components, at least um, uh, like the communication module, uh, so that you can scan the QR code and then create a site for yourself. Okay, and can people install that themselves? In that so case? it's quite simple. We we did a uh, live demo of this, and uh, you can see how easy it is. There's a YouTube link to this, so yes, people could do it on their own. Okay, so the feedback you were talking about on Facebook from the people who were interested into that. Were not these people, I guess, mostly. Who were these people, basically, then? On Facebook. Yeah. There are people that are that have um, uh, solar panels and inverters uh, from MPP Solar, and uh, they're interested in testing another energy management system and potentially also looking into hydrogen. Okay. Because the, the big advantage, sorry, for the energy management system is that it has an amazing uh, UI and UX. So no one. So it's B two C in that case. Yeah, in that case, it's a bit closer to B two C. But I, I think we're tapping into like, you know, like energy geeks, basically. You know, people that are yes. really <laughs> curious about um, how is their system performing. And it's not it's it's not just the average person that has maybe Philips Hue and that turns on or off or changes the color. That's not really who who's coming to us. It's more those who really want to go into the granular details of how their energy perform how their energy system is performing. Mm -hmm. And so what's like what's a business like return on investment so far from you were saying about Facebook and Instagram in general? So you were reaching to a bigger audience and did you also get some bigger customers from these platforms? I wouldn't say that we're getting customers from these platforms, but I would say that we're getting word of mouth from um, the individuals that are following us in these platforms. So it's it's I feel like it's more like we're getting support. Right? We're not making sales on these platforms, um, but we are, we are generating at least interest on Facebook, potential leads. Um, and then on Instagram, it's much more, uh, I think it's more about sharing this idea of the hydrogen generation uh, and, and creating a movement uh, of green hydrogen. Okay, so you're more about the mission in that case, about yeah, hydrogen, absolutely. the hydrogen revolution, and you want to be part of it and see, see basically as one of the leaders who are like initiating this revolution as well. Yeah, and also to, to relate to our generation. I mean, on our team, I think at least 50% of us are like, you know, between 18 and 35. So <laughs> a lot of us are on Instagram and a lot of us are, are sharing the stories and, and the, the, our, our future colleagues will also be Uh, relatively young or, or, or not and experienced. And I think it's important also to relate on a personal individual level of this is who we are, this is what we do. Um, there's no black box. We're actually humans also that um, like to have fun and, and also want to make an impact. Uh, and when I saw on your, so you talked about the, the boot camp when you invite your, your potential partners and I saw one of your events on, on uh, YouTube which was um, the big thing event, a week of hydrogen. Was it one of your boot camp or was it something different? This was a little different. Um, I think there was two um, objectives from this, uh, from this event. One of them was to 
showcase how easy and quick hydrogen uh, can be integrated in a microgrid setup. Um, and also the, the objective of um, sharing the ideas of uh, the AAM technology in Southeast Asia um, throughout the different events like the hydrogen finance and the electrochemistry workshop. So one of the main objective was education, raising awareness. But another really important one for us was bringing the team together. So it was really also a team building exercise where um, we had the team from Russia and the team from Italy uh, come together in Thailand and get to spend time with each other, understand who they're sending emails to and um, and, and to work together, not only on on bringing these workshops together and hosting these workshops and being available for questions, um, but also get to know each other uh, uh, after work, after hours. So this was really the 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 objectives for the the big thing was to to um, to to demonstrate that uh, hydrogen is not as complicated as as it may seem, and that it is very quick to install if we are talking about a microgrid setting. So is it something that you are going to do again in the future? Maybe in a different format, um, but uh, but I think the idea of of showcasing uh, technology and inviting people is a uh, is a good way to um, create a, an interaction opportunity and an understanding of how it works. When you say in a different format, I hear that you probably had some lesson learned. Then I think we. Some lessons learned, I mean, different format as in like, um, what I mean is not different for us to do it differently because I actually am quite proud of, of the, the outcome and, and, how it were, and how it turned out and the overall organization, but a different format than a standard email, a different format than an exhibition. It was, um, I think in terms of from uh, an external perspective to, to meet our team, to, to see um, 40 individuals completely dedicated to what they're doing and to see the 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 emotional side the the human behind the technology i think is more of a an unconventional way to get to know a, a new technology okay yeah at you so maybe in the form of like behind the scenes and mm -hmm. get to know the people working at your different locations exactly Then last question before we go to the, the bonus questions. So you were saying that you were doing these events to also like bring the teams together from the different offices. What have you learned about uh, remote work? What was the, the most difficult part? And do you have any tips? Yeah, I think communication is essential. You need to create uh, times and uh, opportunities to exchange on what you are working on. And this is something that we've especially learned um, during Corona time. I mean, we had no uh, transportation opportunities and it really challenged us to also um, communicate in a more effective way, in a more transparent way, and to also keep the culture and the spirit alive. And we did this by holding uh, Sunday quizzes. So it was more of a, a trivia where we had the, the usual five categories of music, history, culture, geography, and there was always the last category on hydrogen. And every on week- On Sundays? On, yeah, on, <laughs> true, okay. <laughs> well, the rest of the week we are, we, are, uh, we're, we are having our normal calls, you know? It's like we have our engineering calls, we have our chemistry calls, uh, we have the usual um, topics that we, that we address um, in terms of, uh, To answer the question, how do we scale our electrolyzers, and you know what what is on the agenda? But it's 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 work related. Of course, there are some funny moments, uh, but you also need to um, have some some more playful times. And and it was actually quite interesting. I mean, in Italy during the lockdown, there wasn't much to do, and yeah, uh, most of our true. team is in Italy, so um, it, it it's not happening at the moment. Uh, now they're having aperitivo and. Um, The company culture is back on track in terms of life interaction, but during lockdown, uh, yeah, and Sunday Sunday afternoons, it was fantastic to have the the teams from St. Petersburg, the team from Bangkok, the team from Pisa, and from Berlin to join all together and uh, and to learn a lot. It's incredible the amount of knowledge we have. <laughs> Then, I mean, that was already uh, a lot of things that uh, to digest. I think for everyone. So now I'm really <laughs> happy to just. Uh, go to the last question. So the first one would be, what is the best advice you've been given as an entrepreneur? I think follow your gut is the best advice. I've 
I've had and also to stay authentic. Um, I'm in a, we're, we are in a quite difficult field uh, where the competition has been around for a very long time and we're the new kids on the block. But if you stay true to who you are, if you have nothing to hide, then you can only go forward in a confident way. So follow your gut and be authentic are the two top ones. Something feels fishy, don't go. <laughs> okay. What is your favorite, you know, recruiting interview questions to ask candidates during your, your recruiting processes? I like to ask, um, when is the last time that you gave up and why? Because I like to understand what pushed someone to, to, to just throw their arms down and, and, and walk away. Because we will always face some difficult times and we can get through them as a team. But I, wonder, I want to understand, as a, at an individual level, what pushed you to give up? That's a very good one. I didn't, uh, this is the first time I hear about it, and I'll keep it in my, in my <laughs> box. <laughs> what are, uh, which book would you recommend other entrepreneurs like you in the sustainable field or in general to read? Oh, very difficult question. Five books pop to mind. <laughs> um, Can pick up to, you know, one or two of them. Yeah. You have to. Um, okay, I think I, I just stick to the first one that popped up. I would say The Wise Heart. I've really enjoyed reading it because I feel like every page is um, a sort of meditation because it's um, a book on Buddhist, it's a book on Buddhism and psychology. So it's bringing the two uh, together in a very, um, uh, how could I even say it? The book is better than I can even ever explain it. Um, but it's translating basically Buddhism into uh, our understanding of psychology. And I think relating the two together is really interesting to, to have those Buddhist principles and then to adopt them into our contemporary life. Um, it's also broken down into very like digestible bits and I feel like falling asleep to this or waking up to this is a really um, positive and grounding way to start your day. Amazing. I will add it in the links in the resources of the episode. <laughs> What is the, the training or podcast or influencer that you would recommend uh, entrepreneurs and people growing a startup like yours to, to follow? I think Y Combinator does a really good job at condensing all the um, the, the whole toolkit of how to how to uh, kick off a startup. Um, they have a lot of interesting resources if you're starting from the very beginning. So I would recommend them. Um, but I think, to be honest, I, I feel like general news like the Financial Times, Le Monde. Um, I think just being educated about the current events that are happening can really shape your your vision and your understanding of um, uh, of what landscape you're really in, in entering. What is the environment, and how can you create um, a better um, a better product or a better under a uh, better offering? Are there any um, you know news related uh, magazine? Uh, are there any news magazine related to? know hydrogen or to renewables that you would recommend that you are reading every week any renewable related yeah absolutely um uh, so there's a newsletter that i receive on a daily basis because i feel like it's a very good um uh, recap of everything and um it's the carbon brief uh, i don't know if you're familiar with it uh but they do a, an amazing uh job To, to bring together the, the current events um, internationally, locally, and uh, how, how it affects us and sources the, the, the key uh, medias, whether it's the Financial Times or The Economist or Times or Reuters. And um, it's a great way to just stay up to date with what's happening and uh, how this will impact us as well. Okay. So now it's your turn as a final thoughts or comment uh, to tell our listeners anything about Inaptor. Um, I know you are recruiting right now. Uh, you're looking for partners, I guess. So where can, what are you looking for? What can people do? Where can they find you? 
Absolutely. So if you want to join a, a young, exciting team uh, on a mission to uh, replace fossil fuels with green hydrogen, we have 200 open positions <laughs> in the next two years. So um, check out our website, uh, anaptor.com slash careers, and you will find the openings that we have at the moment. And if you are a business um, or an entrepreneur or uh, an association, a community that is interested in getting involved in hydrogen and becoming energy independent or generating their own hydrogen on site, get in touch with us and we'd be happy to help you get started on your hydrogen journey. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Vaitea, and uh, I wish you a a beautiful weekend. Uh, I hope a bit more sunny than what I see currently outside <laughs> in Berlin. And thank you very much for sharing your story and, th and sharing all these invaluable tips. Thank you very much, Gilles. It was an absolute pleasure to be here. If you like this podcast, there are two things you can do that would mean the world to me. The first thing is to sign up for the podcast newsletter. That way you will be notified of the new episodes but you will also get a summary of the learnings at the end of every season. Plus, for each episode, you will get the resources and the list of do's and don'ts that every guest shares with me. And finally, you will also get the opportunity to ask our future guests one question in advance. You can sign up for this newsletter on gtimpact.com. The second thing you can do to be super helpful is to recommend this podcast. For that, you can write a review on Apple Podcasts and share the podcast with your friends, other entrepreneurs, and people trying to build a sustainable future. That way, we can all learn together and work on a brighter future for us, our children, and our planet. Thank you very much, and see you next week for the next episode. Have a nice day.